welcome to episode number 24 of the Animals at Home podcast. Thank you so much for listening in this week. I really, really appreciate it, as always. Before we jump into today's episode, I did want to just quickly make one announcement. There is a foundation in Canada called the Give Foundation that's organizing a large event called the Great Canadian Giving Challenge. And essentially, it's a public contest that benefits any Canadian registered charity. Every dollar that's donated to one of these charities within the month of June acts as a ballot towards this grand prize. The grand prize is a $10,000 donation to the charity that wins the draw. So essentially every dollar that gets donated acts as a ballot. And if you're, if the charity gets drawn at the end, they win $10,000. So as you know, Animals at Home is a sponsor of the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy, which is a charity that protects sections of the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. Animals at Home donates a percentage of the profits to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy through their Amazon affiliates and Google ads and YouTube and whatnot. And we also have shirts available at animalsathome.ca slash podcast, where when you buy an Animals at Home shirt, $5 automatically gets donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. So if you wanted to pick up a shirt, this is a great month to do it because you'll be entering basically five ballots for ARC to hopefully win that $10,000 prize. And if you don't want to spend, you know, the $25 on a shirt, I would definitely recommend or definitely encourage you to go spend a a dollar or two and donate to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. All the links are available on my website. If you just look at the top banner, Save the Rainforest, it's called, you can find uh, how to donate there. So before I introduce this week's guest, I wanted to read you guys something that I had written on a forum about two and a half years ago. So this is about two years before I started the podcast, but the sort of the theme of the show increasing the well-being of the animals that we have in captivity, the theme of animals at home. This has been something that I've been working on for much longer than just when I started the podcast and the YouTube channel. This is something that I've always been kind of toying with in my mind. And this post is sort of an example of me just starting to sort of head down this thought process road. So I'll just read a section of this. So the post reads, I'm just going to start kind of in the middle of it. There are people in the world like us here on this forum who are incredibly passionate about reptiles. People like us are not looking for just a pet as much as we are looking for a complex project that brings along the beauty of the natural world with it. I think we all get enjoyment out of replicating our animal's natural environment through perfect husbandry and enjoy the challenge of doing so. So I kind of rattle on a little bit about sort of my surprise at how many animals were in poor condition. And and I do think there's almost two sections of people who do get involved with reptiles. There's people who are really looking for that complex project. And then there's people who just want impulse pet purchases. And I think there's a way to bring those together to, to teach people the real passion or the real excitement of the hobby, which is creating environments and, and allowing the animals to exhibit natural behaviors. And I don't think there's anyone better to talk about this topic than my guest this week. So this week I spoke with John Courtney Smith, who is the head of science and innovation at Arcadia Reptile. And he's also the author of four very popular reptile guides, which include a guide to metabolic bone disease, reptile and amphibian nutrition, bioactivity and the theory of wild recreation, and his latest book called Fire, which is subtitled The Sun, Its Use and Replication Within Reptile Keeping. So this was without a doubt probably one of the most important conversations I've had regarding my hobby. So regarding the personal steps I take on a daily basis for caring for my animals, there were several moments in this interview or in this conversation that I kind of classify as back to the drawing board where, you know, it made me reanalyze the way I'm caring for things. And there's areas that I can improve, which I'm super excited about. So I, I don't think it matters how sort of what stage of the hobby you're in, beginner, intermediate, or advanced, there's going to be something for you in this interview. John has um, so many really, really good quotes. And this this whole interview is full of great quotes. None of them are by me. All of them are by him. So definitely pay attention to that. But I think probably the most valuable piece of information that John talks about in this interview is we get to talking about the sort of hoarding aspect to reptiles, how easy it is to continuously want reptiles. And I sort of make the point that it's almost like a glitch in the software running our brains that we just constantly want more things. And John offers a perfect solution for that glitch. We sort of have to overwrite some of these natural human instincts. And he offers just a perfect solution to get around that. That will make the hobby more enjoyable for you and I, but also make it more beneficial for the animals that we're caring for. So I don't want to talk too much. I've already talked a ton before this interview. I really want you guys to take this in, listen to the interview. And then I'm going to chat about 
after the interview, I'll chat about some of the changes that I'm going to make. And I want to hear about the changes that you're going to make. Does, did this interview make you want to make some changes in your hobby? And if so, what are they? So make sure you listen to the end and I'll kind of let you know what I'm going to do. And without further ado, here's my conversation with John. Well, John, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Excellent. Thanks for having me, Dylan. It's, it's always a pleasure to be able to sh- talk about reptiles and amphibians and uh, just talk to like-minded people. Yeah, well, I'm happy you let me steal an hour of your time here. And, you know, it's almost difficult to have a conversation with someone like yourself because there are so many different topics that we could talk about. But I, I do really feel right now in the hobby, we're seeing a shift into slightly more conscientious care. And I think maybe North North America might be a little bit behind Europe in this case, but I am seeing a lot more keepers start striving for better care. And that's why it's great to have someone like yourself on so we can kind of pick your brain. I, I would really like to understand your mindset of what got you to where you are today. So, so what initially got you into the hobby? Well, uh, it's a slightly different story for me than most. You know, on some of the other podcasts I've recorded, I've given my kind of family history. But I, I was born into the hobby and into the trade. My parents owned a pet store uh, in in the south of the UK. But we we always had many species of animal coming through the home, even before the shop. And uh, I. I was just captivated by anything natural uh, from the natural world from a really young age. So it's it's literally just been a, a linear progression that I see things in nature that I don't see in very many other things. So <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, I just love it. Um, and, and, and being born into that environment enabled me to explore and, and just observe um, for, you know, what's been over 40 years. Do you have any idea, this is a question that I always ask, and it's really hard to pinpoint if where that interest comes from, do you think? Like, I was, we're kind of preaching to the choir, people that are listening to the podcast, we all have that, like, intense fascination with nature, but not everybody has this. No, they don't, and 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 certainly I think some of it is, it comes in the genes, you know, my my uh, father particularly is, is just the same as me, uh, you know, he just prefers to be outside and and getting involved with animals and really seeing trying to unpick that mystery that's contained within nature and you know my grandparents were the same and my son's the same and my sister's children are the same and uh, so I think there's a there's a there's a real genetic thing that can happen um, but don't get me wrong it can be spontaneous as well I mean what's more exciting than animals exactly not a, yeah not a lot no, definitely not. So then it, as you grew up, obviously you had the surrounded by animals, which is fantastic. Yeah. And then it, sort of education wise, did you pursue animals as a focus of study? No, I, I, I studied the sciences, of course. Um, and I always wanted to go into uh, animal husbandry and carry on within the pet trade, particularly. I have a, a particular love for the pet hobby. Um, you know, I do a lot of work with zoos and big private collections, and that's outstanding. The work that they do, conservation is a real big thing for me. But I, I love the, the ability for people to be able to enjoy the hobby just as I do in their own home as well. So so the pet trade's always really excited me. So I studied the sciences. I eventually, after I got married, I studied um, uh, optics, so um, yeah, opticians. And uh, I qualified within that for a few years in the physical aspect of making spectacles and the the physics that went behind that, which just that it's light and and lenses. It's exactly the same. So all the training I did over a decade in optics um, came very, very useful when I came back into the pet trade. Um, so, so quite, you know, it was a, quite a miracle the way that I came back into Arcadia, plucked out of optics and, and into, into this, uh, role again, uh, 13 years ago. So, um, yeah, but my whole education, no, no, I didn't do a degree in zoology. Um, I've certainly taught them. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite, it's quite, it's quite a humbling thing to do to stand in front of professors in some of the the world's most elite universities and lecture. And but but no, I never did that. 
you know, my knowledge has been gleaned and I've learned it. I've done a lot of ongoing education, um, different courses. You know, I did 19 university courses in one year a few years ago, just trying to uh, update my tangible knowledge, get some certificates behind myself. But um, Well, that's really, one of the... Yep. I, I last week when I was talking to somebody who who is a biologist, and I had said this kind of this quote that always reoccurs, and you know the people who are in the pet trade typically know what the scientists end up discovering later because yes. when you, you, you're working with your hands, and 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 I work in the sport field as well because I'm a coach, and that's sort of sort of the same thing. The sport scientists always come to us with this like crazy data. Look at this, and we're like, oh yeah, we've been doing that for years because yes. we figured it out, you know. So that's yeah. kind of how it, it ends up it ends up working. So how did you how did you move your way from the sort of the optics to Arcadia? It, it, I was headhunted. There's no other logical explanation for it. I got a call out of the blue, and this this company called Arcadia, which obviously is a 50 odd year, 60 year nearly uh, old company, a UK company, were looking for somebody who knew something about birds and reptiles, and and my name had prop, cropped up. And you know, I'd I'd kept and worked with birds and reptiles all of my life, and uh, so given the opportunity, I, I jumped at it. And and that gave me that gave me the unique focus that I needed to really spur things on. Um, so that must have been just like a perfect yeah, fit. It was, yeah. It was it was uncanny. Yes, that's awesome. So so that this is what I really would like to understand. What motivated you to start developing sort of the theories that eventually became bioactivity and the theory of uh, wild recreation? Because obviously this is not something you. I'm sure you've been working on this for years before writing the book. But there must have been something in your mind that thought. Okay, we need to be doing more here for the animals. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I I've always been very honest. Growing up in the pet trade, particularly in the 1980s and 1990s, it was a very different hobby to the hobby that we see now. You know, we things didn't really do so well, and I'd seen a lot of travesty, a lot of things that made me guilty, and um, I, I came. Uh, to the hobby again professionally with a, a sense that I wanted things to be different. I wanted to find some aspect of revolution. I wanted to unpick the mysteries that cause reptiles to continue breathing in and out and try and find out what they were and explain those to people. And um, for me, I'm very analytical. I like to look at the internal and the external of, of how biology works and try and see where the, the the magic happens, what's reliant upon what and and, and how do we replicate it. So so you know those theories first came out when I, I I was aghast really that we were still seeing so much in the way of metabolic bone disease. You know, the the, the pet hobby has been constant or absolutely obsessively concentrating on calcium and and, and vitamin D3 for 25 years or more. Yet we still saw large amounts of metabolic bone disease. And that proved to me that we, there was still something missing. We, we were missing something. What weren't we doing that was right? What, why were these animals still getting nutritional disease? And, um, you know, that led on to me uh, studying and learning and, and coming up with that first quite basic book on, on metabolic bone disease. It was the first of its type. Nobody had written a book on MBD at the time. And uh, just trying to explain what it was and trying to explore those theories. And as the years passed, you know, books take a long time to write. The, the bioactivity book was a two year project um, in terms of physical writing, but study and coming up with the different manuscripts. I was probably working for three or four years before that. Um, and I, be, I became uniquely aware that these problems don't happen in the wild. And if, if we don't see these nutritional diseases, then we are doing something wrong. As carers, we're missing something out. And I, I started to see this synergy, um, which I expanded upon in, in the fourth book, uh, within what I describe as the three parameters of overall nutrition. Um, but I started to see this synergy between everything that goes into an animal and everything that surrounds it. And, and that's everything. So we're looking at external nutrition. So wavelengths of the energy that's contained within the 
wavelengths of light and um, how they move, what they consume, what they're clambering over, what happens to the body as an animal uh, moves itself around. As a trainer, you'll understand that, you know, even if people have problems with digestion, then one of the best things they can do is exercise. Why? Because you want to get the blood pumping. You need to get the vital organs shifting around in the body. You've got to get those gases and fluids moving. And, and it's exactly the same for reptiles. And so I came up with this concept of, well, if, if the wild is perfection, this ethereal nirvana that reptiles live in, then replicating that in captivity in a safe and measured way must be the answer to see them be able to live that wildlife in captivity. Um, and of course, that was a kind of embryonic stage of the theory, and I'm constantly progressing it. You know, I updated it in the latest book, and I'll update it and update it and update it. Um, so, you know, the, the bioactive side of it was actually quite incidental to the wild recreation part of it. You know, you can have quite good systems of replicated wild environments without maintaining a bioactive substrate. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm passionate about bioactivity, don't get me wrong, but it's that aspect of naturalism working within measured and active external energy fields and a, a full and varied, well-thought-out diet that actually causes that animal to live, reproduce and carry on as it would in the wild, minus the threat of, of avoidable disease and predation. Um, right. So that, that, that's where that came from, really. It, it really was very linear. Yeah, and I, for me, I have that sort of same natural instinct. Like even when I was a young, when, when I was young, and I got my first crested gecko, like one of the first things I did was like Google rainforests in New Caledonia. Like I just wanted to see what the environments look like. And then you know, you're setting up a new enclosure. I have like thermometers all over the place, yes. measuring different spots because you're trying to hit these. You know, and what I find really interesting is the evolution of the hobby because and something I hadn't really thought about until I started reading your book was, you know, 20 years ago, there was nothing for equipment. Like you tell kind of a funny story about how you guys had to heat enclosures using like aquarium heaters yes, that's and, and right. whatnot. And, you know, and it's really, really come a long way, but Quickly. the hobby needs, the hobby is an organism of itself almost. And we need to yeah. allow it to continue to evolve. Yes, I agree. I agree. We've we've come a long, long way. There's a long, long way to go. You know, I'm working on bits of new tech now that you won't see for five years or so. But we're constantly trying to change and evolve the hobby as we're trying to basically we're trying to get that huge flaming ball of gas in the solar system and bring it down into a, a state that we can pop it safely into a vivarium. And uh, if we once we can properly understand the way the sun works, everything else will fall into line. You, you know, you're right. But we, we, we've got a checkered past. That's for sure. You know, back in the day, we aquarium heaters in milk bottles of water and candles underneath glass and uh, oh, <laughs> electric light bulbs under ceramic or terracotta flower pots and heaven forbid those terrible plug-in plastic heat rocks. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we've seen it all, you know, the progression into heat mats of their various types and levels of safety. And, uh, you know, we, we're learning all the time, learning all the time. The hobby is a really exciting place to be at the moment because we're, we're now at a level that, that I certainly see every little change that we make is actually having a visible positive outcome in the animals. You know, I'm keeping animals now um, that very rarely survive past the first week, uh, historically. You know, I, I've said before, the Mellor's chameleon, when I was a child, you know, a young person growing up, was always called the nine-day lizard. Because by the time you unpacked it, you had about nine days before it was pushing up daisies. You know, it, it was a horrendous time to live in. But now look at guys in America, in the UK, in, in, and, and in Europe, breeding lines of Meliori now. You know, amazing. Things like Agama Agama, another lizard that would die on. You'd have to buy hundreds just so that you had a hundred to sell. 
Um, you know, they're, they're, I saw a shipment not so long ago, 100% survival, and they're all doing really well, colouring up. Now that we understand the uh, energy and dietary provision that they need, and by studying the wild not just the habitat, but their place in that habitat, understanding their social hierarchy and building uh, a system around that, alleviate stress, which alleviates the pressure on the immune system, and which, which I believe in, in species like red-headed agama and the blue-headed agama and things like colotes, um, fenceless, uh, you know, tree dragons and... Uh, the flying dragons and all of these species that would typically die within a few days historically remove the stresses and provide them with energy and and they're fine that then means we can use that resource to create dedicated long-term captive bred bloodlines and and see those species carry on uh, for for many generations to come um you know my fear is that we have to live in a world that is totally dominated by corn snakes, leopard geckos, and, and bull pythons. You know, love them to bits, I do, but we need some choice. People need to work with different species. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. And it almost seems like we, we're, we're evolving, new technology is coming, we're moving away from the, you know, the milk bottle scenario, but then yeah. we got bogged down into this breeder's mentality where we started stack, it's that industrialized, minimalistic style care, yeah. which which really sort of set us back a foot. Like it seemed like we were actually doing a really good job of progressing. And then we hit this roadblock of, you know, people throwing uh, their animals in into drawers. Yeah, you're quite right. Now, now we have to be very clear here. The, the method of keeping reptiles in bioactive and naturalistic systems is not new. It's not new at all. In actual fact, 100, 150 years ago, there's books that detail how to set up terraria um, for locally sourced reptiles and amphibians that are based on those same theories. The trouble was, was that we didn't have the technology that allowed us to keep those species long term in those ways. Typically, plants died off, the substrate stagnated. We didn't have UV systems. We had very, very below par um, heating, you know. So th there was this natural progression away from naturalistic and bioactive keeping um, into the super clean and sterile. And I think, you, you know, for me, I, the idea of racking snakes up uh, just so that you can peer in a drawer every now and again, or leopard geckos, or whatever you want to keep, blue tongue skinks, to me makes no sense at all. You know, we're in this hobby because we like to participate with nature. We're both drawing energy from from nature and it from us as we care for it. So that the whole rack and high thing doesn't appeal to me. And I, I always come back to the same point. Just because you can keep a leopard gecko in a 12 inch per 12 inch per three inch box in the dark um, and it will live and reproduce doesn't mean to say we ought to. It just proves that the power of reproduction within nature is a far greater force than any level of poor care that we feel selfish enough to visit upon them. Totally. Um, you know, so uh, I do understand the need for high level production of animals. We have to supply our hobby, but I think there must be a, a way which we can we can do that without removing the the animals right really to be able to move and dig and express natural behavior and and be exposed to light and uh, you know uh, differing diets and each other um more naturally yeah it's like the those more robust species like your ball pythons and corn snakes and the fact that they're so easy to breed really gave the hobby a false sense of success almost it's like oh we're doing great because they're breeding it's like well maybe not and it, so, so that kind of gets me down to the why should we own animals because i do think that I had said this yesterday in a video that I posted, if there were no ball python morph, morphs, nobody's going to stack up a bunch of snakes to continue to breed normal ball pythons. People are addicted to developing different, you know, phenotypes of animals, which isn't fair to the animal itself. So what are some 
good reasons for somebody to own or want to own a reptile? Well, I mean, uh, humans have this, most humans have this inbuilt desire to interact with nature, you know, and that really isn't, in a sense, it's a right that we have because we're alive, you know, and we, we're exploratory and we want to see these animals and interact with them. But we, you know, ever since man first came about, we've captured things and kept them and worked them and looked after them and farmed them. And, and you know, I think uh, there's so much research that says that pet care is good for you, extends your life, increases children's IQ levels by 10 points, apparently. Wow. You know, the, a- animal interaction is good for us. We're not always good for the animals. And we have to check our own motives and ethics there. But certainly, you know, that there is a species available for just about everybody in every walk of life, whether that is a Indian stick insect or a lithops, uh, you know, living stone or, you know, there, 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 there is a form of natural interaction that we can all take and enjoy um without causing harm or detriment to the animals themselves you know guys like you and i we can have big collections i have help um obviously at a day-to-day basis i don't enjoy the best of health myself but i can still enjoy the act of studying and uh, observing and interacting with animals and i think it's it's so important i've certainly i've always made sure that my son you know is 18 this year has, has had access to as many different types of animals for as long as possible ever since he's been born. And, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful thing. It's a powerful totally. thing. And it, it, yeah, it is that interest in watching the animal behave naturally, which I think most people get, it gets most people into the hobby and then some people maybe take a wrong turn here and there. But I think that's what, you know, wild recreation is all about is being able to walk into your room and, and, and watch your animals. And it's funny because I only have six animals and you know how large these reptile collections do end up getting. But as soon as I started reading through your work, my first instinct was like, wow, I have too many. I need to like, this is good. (laughs) I need to do better with just these six and just do the best I can because it is so easy to just continually pile on animals, but to care for them and to actually get them to behave the way they naturally behave is a lot harder than, you know, it's hard to do when you have, you know, 20 or 30 animals. You're absolutely right. And, and, you know, that is a point that I make. I would, I would much rather see keepers have two or three animals or a single animal than 50 or 60 tubs that they're not enjoying. You know, if you can take that space and create a slice of the wild, you know, one side of wild recreation is quite selfish for humans because what we're doing is we're replicating, a, as I said, a, a slice of the wild so that we can enjoy it. We, you want to get a, a slice of, of the, uh, the mountainside or, uh, or uh, the scrubland of the Mediterranean or, you know, a Kenyan series of bushes or whatever you're going to replicate should be aesthetically pleasing to the keeper. And it should. That's something we've created and we have a right to enjoy that. The primary, the primary reason we're doing it, of course, is to improve the health and welfare of the animal. To do so, we do need larger enclosures, which means having less animals at home um, and investing more financially per enclosure in order to do that. You know, one, one of my favorite enclosures here is my flat rock lizard enclosure, the Platysaurus intermedius. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's 36 inches per 30 by 18 glass. It's quite a big enclosure for an animal that is quarter of an inch deep and six inches long, you know. But making that uh, and introducing the animals into that enclosure where we've got a full rock system which they can get in and climb over. They can hit exactly the same indexes of UV as they ex- experience in the wild, the same wavelengths of infrared, um, very brightly illuminated, lots of different species of live food, natural substrate, ton, you know, these kind of arid species of grasses and plants. And just to sit back at a distance and watch those animals initially survive, because that's something they didn't used to do, 
and then start to color up and grow and interact with each, with each other and start to see the the social hierarchy of a small group uh, start to appear. I learned more about the theory of wild recreation, even though I'd already already written the book. But in practice, I learned more over a season of just watching that enclosure for a few months and seeing what was going on. I learned more about the whole theory in, in that time than I did with my academic studying and, and, and research for writing the book, uh, actually getting to grips with an enclosure and seeing it come to life. It, 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 it's very special, I promise you. If you can, you almost become one with it. You, you start to see things in animals you've never seen before, behaviours, different tendencies, the way that colours change, different social cues and communication. And uh, it's really special. It really is. But if I'd had them, if I'd had them in a 12, 12, 18, uh, as some of the care guides say, you can keep a, a pair, they're, they're going to be so stressed out and whirling around a central branch that you're never, ever going to see any of that. Mm -hmm. And that, that is really the, the fun part about the hobby is l doing the research, creating the, uh, the enclosure and setting it up in a way that you know the animals are going to use and then watching them get to interact with it is really incredible. And that was sort of the, the speed bump that I hit with the hobby is just like what you're saying is coming to terms with the fact that there is a selfish aspect to keeping the animals because I kept pushing myself, okay, I want to recreate the, this, you know, slice of the Amazon rainforest. And then you get to that point, like, well, why, why am I doing that? Why, why, why do I own the animal if all I'm doing is just trying to recreate its natural habitat? But like you said, there's so much we can learn about it. And as a hobbyist, we, we do have a right to have that set up in our, in our home and be able to watch it. But making sure that the quality of care is there is super important. And, and one of my favorite quotes that I came across that I have no idea who said it, although maybe you said it <laughs> because it's, it sounds a lot like something you would say, but it's something like, the better the care, the more the animals will reward you with their natural behavior. Yeah, oh, I agree. Perfect. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, and there's nothing more exciting than watching them move around and 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 you know exploring their enclosure. So so in terms of what do you think the minimum standard of care should be? Like obvi like obviously you have a spectrum. You have everything from your paper towel tub up to you know the enclosures that you guys would have at your facility. Is there is there a minimum standard you think there is? Well, again, we have to be clear. There's no clear cut lines here. You know, there is there is a place within our hobby and a need for all types of husbandry, as long as that husbandry is fulfilling the needs of a species. Now, let me explain. If you have a, an animal that is weak or sick, has a bacterial load, you know, a negative bacterial load or a parasitical load, then bringing that into a naturalistic or, bio, or you know, the, the next step on a bioactive system is only going to make that animal worse over time as it consistently uh, runs the risk of reinfecting itself. So there is a valid place for sterility in the hobby towards the needs of the species and each individual animal within that species. You know, we have to have good quarantine facilities. We have to have good medical facilities. And I, we, we can't just say rub keeping, tub keeping is dead and buried and gone. Plastic enclosures are gone. You should never buy them because there is a need for that for certain types of care and, and, cer and certain life stages for the animal. You know, I don't believe really that people will get the best out of their animals if they have healthy animals kept in racks or tubs. Um, you, there's no possible way you can enjoy that animal by opening a tub for 20 minutes every week and staring at it. That's, that's not an interaction with wildlife. That's my opinion. Okay, The keeping of that animal in that way may not be proven peer-reviewed to be detrimental. But I think we can pro probably safely assume that providing an animal with adequate enrichment and uh, natural parameters to experience will uh, bring a, a healthier, more balanced animal than one that's just locked in the dark on a paper towel for its whole life needlessly. I, I think one of the 
most important things every at home keeper can do is stop using plastic plants and ornaments. You know, for me, the risk, and I outline it in the book, the risk of volatile organic compound release around heated plastics is far too great for for me to undertake. You know, if you if you want to use water bowls, you can use glass or ceramic. You don't need to use plastic. Plastic plants placed near heat lamps, to me, that poses a risk. Uh, they're eaten by live food. Um, larger reptiles eat them. They harbor bacterial blooms and funguses if you're not cleaning them they don't look very nice either and but so removing plastics resins and silks out of our enclosures is a good first step for somebody who's kept who's had to keep in a sterile way for a long period of time but wants to progress their hobby you know so moving into live plantage you're going to have something that looks better to you will be oxygenating the air around the animal will put if as long as you choose plant species right of course will pose no risk to the animal and uh, it's not going to allow build up of things like cyanide within what is a very poorly ventilated box for most vivariums um so i think you know moving out of sterility the best thing to do the first step is introduce some live plants into your enclosure whether they're planted in a substrate or not whether they're still pot bound doesn't really matter but you will you will immediately start to see different behavior in the animals um and then of course the, if people aren't keen on the full aspect of bioactivity now let's make a really strong point here Bioactive keeping is not for the lazy keeper, but maintaining a bioactive system is not an excuse to not clean your animals out. If you want to maintain a bioactive system, you will be doing hours more work a week than you are in a sterile system. We have to be honest here. It's, it's not easy to keep this balance of heat, light, plant growth, substrate cleaning, spot checking, you know, assessing custodian cultures and adding to that and feeding to it and making sure live food isn't decimating all your plant. There's there's a lot of work in bioactive systems. But, of course, the naturalistic system, the step before for full bioactivity, will actually propel your keeping forward. You know, there's, the only difference between a naturalistic system and a bioactive system is that a naturalistic system hasn't had your custodian culture added to the substrate. In every other way, it's exactly the same. So you're going to be having the benefits of enrichment, mental and physical. You're going to have that um, resistance in the leg muscles as they're walking through a safe uh, substrate, toning the body, being more active, more places to hide and climb, um, better heat dissipation through accurate rock placement, uh, better oxygenation through live plant growth. And, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Naturalistic keeping is as valid as bioactive keeping. The only difference between bioactive and naturalistic, as I say, is that the bio bioactive system is to an extent self-cleaning and should provide cultures which should maintain uh, a beneficial ecosystem in miniature for your animal to live in. Um, so we are in this really exciting place where, where every keeper's got a choice whether they keep in full sterility or in this quite nice blending up between starting off with natural rocks and branches and a few live plants and then into naturalistic uh, mineral rich substrates and rock work and high decoration and then into full bioactivity um the choice is everybody's you know yeah it's i i love that and i i do like even this this I don't even mind, you know, breeders using the sterile environments to produce animals for the hobby. But I, I do really like the idea of having the ability for the keeper to grow because you're absolutely right. A, a person with their first animal might not want to be tackling their, a bioactive enclosure because there's way too many variables that they could screw up to impact the health of their animal. But having the ability for them to just grow from something a little very simple to naturalistic to bioactive is so important. And it's almost like a positive feedback loop because you're as you do, as you increase your level of care, your animal is going to behave in a way that's going to make you want to continue to progress your care. 
Absolutely. It's it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You just keep going on and on and on and on and on. And um, I don't know what the next step is. I don't know where we're going to be in five years' time, but you can bet your bottom dollar it'll be better. We'll be doing things more accurately. Animals will be um, more colourful, more aggressive, faster, living longer, reproducing better. Um, we're not slowing down. You know, I mean, the good news is, is that we, you know, we now have access to the technology in terms of everything that you need from a terrarium up to the heating and lighting systems uh, is, is so available and easy to understand that pretty much anybody can can at least get to the naturalistic stage within their first year or so, um, if not from starting off. Um there's no reason not to now you know it's all very affordable it's all easy to use there's plenty of re educational resources uh, that people can use like your podcast you know it's a good long-term piece of education that people can draw from and watch their hobby progress yeah it does and it does seem like i don't know if you feel this way but i feel like lizards and geckos and amphibians are really on the path to success in this domain but for some reason snakes continuously get the short end of the stick and i know that there's the ball python and the corn snake trade and, and whatnot but but even then like for i don't see a lot of bioactive snake enclosures i think is it just because they produce way more waste at once so it's more difficult like snakes are harder because they produce more waste you said exactly the same thing it's actually the right thing um but there is no reason why most species of snake can't be kept in, a, in, in naturalistic and full bioactive enclosures. In fact, m I've got lots of uh, experience of cases where, where snakes that were habitual respiratory tract infection sufferers were removed from tubs and put into naturalistic systems, never suffered again. Never, you know. And uh, so snakes can be kept bioactively naturalistically in fact there's a couple of uk facebook groups and europe wide or worldwide facebook groups within the royal bull python market where it is almost totally everybody keeping them naturalistically if not bioactively now bull pythons you know and they're you they're using a six foot long three foot high two foot deep viv grassing it putting in a hillock and branches and rocks and just letting that snake be a ball python you know there is nothing more aesthetically pleasing than a natural color garner royal that ball part that we, we call the royal pythons you guys call them ball pythons um that a natural color or a natural mutation like the yellow belly or you know spot nose low pied occur in the wild they are the most attractive mesmerizing snakes if you give them space to move guess what they bloody they well move they're <laughs> all the time they're going around climbing digging about you know they very rarely sit for days on end in the same place um, and you start to see a completely different animal. It's almost totally. like having a corn snake, really, but bigger. They, they, it seems to be this act of restricting them that, that gives them their nick, old nickname of uh, pet rock. Yeah, so, so moving snakes from this, uh, uh, the old method of uh, sterility into naturalistic and bioactive it enables them to show more of their natural behavior and tendencies. And, and, and for sure, I'm, I'm sure now that restricting an animal into a small tub is the very reason that they become boring and lazy. Mm -hmm. Give them space to move and they do. Yes. Yeah. And you know, I don't own any ball pythons, but I had, I, I kept seeing this recurring thing over and over, which is exactly what you're talking about. Since they spend all of their time in quote termite mounds, you can just throw them in a tub and, and they'll be completely fine. So I, I kept seeing that over and over and not having a ball python, I've never really done the actual research, but last week I decided to go, okay, let me see if I can find any academic sources that support that claim. And I could not find a single one. And every source I found said they are active at night and they actively hunt. They actively will track down prey. And, it, it really blew my mind, the sort of the conviction that these people have to, they feel like they're saying truths, 
but they have no clue where those myths have originally came from. They're just sort of spouting information over. And you need to be exposed to the behavior of an animal in a naturalistic setup to realize, wow, I've been doing this wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's quite a humbling experience uh, to go through that and to see differences in the animals. You know, it's if, if I don't know if you ever kept parrots, but, you know, I, do, I, I love to keep, I love birds as well. And if the, there's a, a huge difference between your macaw when it's kept inside to if you have a 25 foot long flight for one and you give it access to fly as well, you see a completely different animal. Now that doesn't mean to say I'm against having parrots in the home. I have one, you know, (laughs) I don't have a problem with that at all, but you have to allow that natural behavior. And if you allow it, if you provide for it, if you allow that enrichment, you will be rewarded with an animal that is more balanced that is better colored, that is healthier, that is more interactive, you see a different animal entirely. Um, yeah, it's because uh, they, are, they are programmed to do these behaviors, but if they're not given the enrichment, they won't do it because there's, not, there's no way for them to do it. And, you know, one of the really interesting things is that these animals do serve an ecological purpose. You know, they have that sort of micro niche in the wild that they, I mean, you talk about it in your book, right? There are certain things that these reptiles do in their native environment that helps the ecosystem function. And it's just sort of like their duty as an individual is to run through these activities. And if they're not given the opportunity to do that, it's going to affect them. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I mean, every species has its place in the ecosystem and, and it doesn't matter how many generations we breed away from the wild. You know, when you get through F1, F2 and going on and on and on and on and on, you will never, ever breed out those wild tendencies if you allow them to display them. You know, with this, uh, I'm, I'm quite excited about a, a large scale project that someone's setting up with uh, a group of one male leopard gecko wild type and five or six females in a very big enclosure all rock worked and live planted and grass you know the leopard gecko is not an it's not really even an arid species it's certainly not a desert species um uh, it's more of a they, they occur f- over such a vast geographical area right from semi-arid scrubland into emergent forest you know but they the the leopard gecko the more you study the wild forms and there's five or six different subspecies um you know that's developed over millions of years all with slightly different needs and and uh, places in that ecosystem but they are always found in groups very rarely solitary you know it's a patriarchal society you get one alpha male and a group of um sort of alpha females really and then working in concentric circles away from that you'll have beta and beta females and younger males which the male will the alpha male will keep in check they use a communal latrine they all go to the toilet in the same place they are absolute opportunistic feeders you know, they will quite easily and happily consume each other as well as wow. small beetles and crickets and birds' eggs and, and whatever. There was this one scientific paper, really interesting um, sort of report on the species that shows two males will fight and the loser will offer up his tail to the, to the winner and the, the, the male will eat the tail and wow. uh, and go off being fat rich and everything you can see the de- the developmental sense there but if we kept a group of of leopard geckos in a really nice you know maybe six by five by three that kind of size with all natural slate and rock and scrubland plants and illuminate it properly and you had a social system in there that fell that falls um, accurately within their natural social hierarchy, being patriarchal with a number of females, there is no reason at all why we wouldn't start to see more and more of their long-standing behaviour, the behaviour that occurs in their part of the ecosystem, come out in front of our eyes. You know, I, I've got a, a leopard gecko here that lives in a, a naturalistic system, um, which is fairly sizable it's not as big as i want it to be but 
we're allowing him place to climb. We're allowing him places to, um, I mean, literally climb vertically and uh, scoop long branches horizontally and find shade and find high levels of light and no light and, you know, a deep substrate and all the things that we want to do. And I can tell you that leopard gecko is visible nearly every day climbing brush bushes. You know, they, they do climb and they will climb and they are seen climbing in the wild. So why do we why why have we kept them on sand, which is fundamentally wrong, in very shallow enclosures with very little enrichment, and and treated them as a purely terrestrial animal for the last twenty odd years? The only reason is because we could. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it's so, <laughs> it's so weird that there's this giant gap between the at the captive animal and the wild counterpart, and like you said, these are these are not domesticated animals in the hobby. They are just wild des or descendants of the wild animals. They have the yep. same care requirements. And there's like these weird almost myths or memes that started maybe like 15 or 20 years ago of how to care for an animal and no one's ever checked up on it. They're just like, it should be good. You throw some sand down with like a backdrop of some red mountains and yes. that's your, and then a fake <laughs> cactus and there's your leopard gecko thing. Yeah. And no one went like, wait a minute, where are these in the wild and what does it look like? Or even worse, glow in the dark mushrooms. Have you seen those? <laughs> oh, yeah. Who thought that up? <laughs> I've never exactly. Seen like such where a are thing? those things coming from? <laughs> no. It's crazy. Yes. Uh, so so it, it is really interesting and, and that's what I think people should really, like, because there's a, it's almost like a glitch in our software running our brain that we just want to continuously get more animals. Instead, I think having people directed to just advancing your care on one animal, you could actually yeah. get just as much enjoyment out of that than adding continuously adding more animals to your collection. But far more enjoyment. It's far, yeah. far more fulfilling. The human as a species is a collector. Again, we, we, we're no different from a reptile or an ape or a bird or whatever. We, we, you know, we're just highly developed, we like to think. Um, Glow in the dark mushrooms. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Um, but, but as part of our de developmental or evolutionary, whatever word you want to use, history, we've had to become collectors whether that's food or ornamentation or firewood or, or anything. We are collectors and we can't override that. You know, people collect stamps, they collect coins, they collect dogs, they collect novels. But we, we all collect something. If you have an, an interest in natural history and you are able to keep live animals, it only makes sense that you want to collect. But actually channeling that desire to collect large amount of animals into actually collecting knowledge of how to keep animals properly and then seeing the animals do it is far more fulfilling than scooting around 25 different vivs trying to feed and water when you get back knackered at the end of the day then, you, you know, we just haven't got time for that in our lives anymore. So uh, it's better, you know, if you can devote 25, 30 minutes a day into a two or th one or two or three good-sized, properly functioning enclosures, you, you, it'll be far more fulfilling. Oh, yeah, and that's uh, that's exactly right. I think that I really love what you just said there, collecting information, because it, 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 it's the same program. You can actually sort of trick your brain into – into instead collecting animals, collecting information and trying to advance your care. And I've said it before on the show, like our want to want animals is stronger than our want to care for them a lot of the time. Like as soon as you get one after a couple months, you're like, oh, I could probably, what's a different animal that will be as, as good, good as well. And we can actually redirect that into care. Yeah, that's Fantastic. certainly a risk. Yeah, the, the, it's a, a strong desire. Tell me about it. This this is what I do twenty four seven for years and years and years. I, I'm in a lucky position where I can pretty much obtain anything that takes my desire. But let me tell you, you know, I, I have help. I have other people that help me to maintain this level of of uh, of animals. I certainly couldn't do it on my own. How many animals are at the Arcadia headquarters? Um, we have probably. We just added a couple, actually, of small ones. We've probably got about 15 enclosures, um, and some of them have got small groups. Um, so th there's a number of species here. There's a number of species here. And w when I see the pictures on Instagram, that I think that I think you mostly curate that account. It, it just looks amazing. Like it just looks like a playground for somebody like us. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's I, I can't stress enough how much hard work it is. 
You know, oh, yeah. it's hard work. It looks nice. It functions well. We have the odd disaster. This is not that reptile keep in Nirvana that I was talking to you about. That's what we all want. But things go wrong. You know, at certain points, all livestock becomes dead stock. Uh, it, that's you can't ever get away from that and you know things come out of the ordinary sometimes and you you have challenges to go through you know we, it was heartbreaking earlier in the year I don't know whether you'd been following the story but we were working with a, an adult water dragon that we rehomed which was in a it was the sickest illest water dragon that I've ever seen in all my life with horrendous metabolic bone disease it was uh absolutely a candidate for euthanization many times and certainly when it first arrived here but actually the experience that i had with that animal enabled me to write another whole mini book um, which is only available to qualified vets and zoos which came up with a, a possible or actually quite an effective treatment for metabolic bone disease by using these principles of the uh, three parameters of overall nutrition and you know for an animal that was not able to support itself on any limbs had numerous twists up its spine was fitting in stargazing day and night we we, we cured it really within the first month with the help of a vet of course um, and gave it another whole year's pretty active life i mean by month three that thing could climb five feet in the air from the floor you know it's a six foot high vivarium and it could get right to the top under its own steam with no help now for an animal that had no muscle tone broken bones uh, as i say fit in stargazing it was dying in front of our eyes we gave it another whole year but it died you know that was heartbreaking um we learned a lot over it, but we, we we experienced the same heartache as every other keeper out there. You know, I think we did well with that animal. We gave it another year and it had a good, good year, really good. Um, but the damage that had occurred to it from before us having it, the damage that caused the metabolic bone disease, um, had degraded its internal organs and damaged them to such a level where it was never going to live 10 or 15 years. It wasn't possible. You know, there's one thing I say in the books, all of the books, by the time you see symptoms of metabolic bone disease, the disease is already very advanced in the body. You know, I, I kind of crudely categorized visible MBD as being kind of stage four in the way that humans categorize disease because the level of damage inside in terms of bone chemistry, blood chemistry, liver, kidney, heart, lung, all the vital organ functions are depreciated and or damaged by the time you see that. So, um, you know, the, that animal was never, ever going to have a long life, but it was still heartbreaking to go through here. You know, and, and we're supposed to be professionals. Uh, I can tell you, tears were shed. It was a hard time. It was a hard oh, time. I don't doubt that. And, you know, it's, it's crazy how unbelievably robust these animals are. Like, these things can really put up with an incredible amount of malcare. And, and that's a perfect example where... Like you don't understand how you even got another year out of it. And it's no. amazing that you can actually turn these animals around even for a short time. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And that, that, you know, that I was conscious all the way along that we couldn't have the animals suffer. Um, you know, and, and, and I, I actually came to the, to the conclusion that while there was fight in the animal's eyes, while it was trying to feed, while it was interacting with me rather than on its side with its eyes closed all the time it had fight then i had a, an absolute responsibility to fight as hard for it as it was fighting to stay alive and uh, so rather than say goodbye to it a year beforehand which many people would have done and i'm not saying that we should extend the life of chronic mbd suff suffering animals in almost all cases we shouldn't uh, it's a horrendous disease to put them through um, but with good care and expert advice alongside us, we were able to take 
day by day decisions of of what to do with it. Um, it yeah, it was very interesting but heartbreaking eventually. Well, and, and he kind of it serves a higher purpose in a way, allowing you to rewrite some some of your work and, and giving people a proper guide to to how yes. to care for this. Yeah, yeah, I learned a, a vast amount, a vast amount. And uh, so, if if people are you know, they're listening to this and they're like, okay, I want to increase my care and maybe they have a simple, I know we've already covered a few things like getting rid of plastic plants and, and maybe adding, you know, getting some substrate that they can dig through and whatnot. And one, one other last quick thing I wanted to, to talk about was lighting because I know that's a huge thing now and that's something where I'm very weak on. Obviously with my geckos, I have proper lighting, but with snakes, it's something that people don't do. So what what should people be doing for i know you have an entire book on this so if they really want the details they can read read the book but in terms of the uv with snakes the myth is they don't need it yes and it's a total myth will they survive without it yes um i think the watchword for every aspect of reptile care and certainly within uh providing light to uh captive reptiles and full spectrum light you know light is a source of energy if you could see light you would see trillions upon trillions of tiny little batteries all within their own color and energy level just pouring down and pushing into everything all over the uh everything that the light encounters it is physical fuel light isn't just i've turned a light on and i can see you know it's actual energy this is proper science fiction stuff in reality and if there is well, the watchword for me is if a species is in any way able to encounter unfiltered natural daylight in any quantity whatsoever in its wild environment then it will have a dedicated use for and level of protection against that energy source that's how nature works, whether that is within its visual acuity, whether that is within topping up its or producing its own vitamin D3, whether it's the sterilization of the skin or the maintenance of the respiratory tract or bringing on hormone surges leading to reproduction. There is uses for and protection against that energy. Now, even in one of the very first books I wrote, I used the analogy of the mangrove snake. And, uh, you know, we have a, an animal there that is a primary nighttime feeder. But you will always find that black snake in the canopies in the mangrove swamps, high up, all day long asleep. Same with green tree pythons, same, you know, many species of snake that are more active at night you will find in the trees and bushes during the day. You do not have to be awake to benefit in full from the power of the sun. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. So, so if there is, if we, if we ascribe to the, to the theory that natural development leads to use and protection, then there is a use and protection and by including those same levels of energy in captivity to the levels or a moderated level that the animal would experience in the wild, whilst giving it good access to graduated shade, can only be beneficial. You will be plugging an evolutionary gap somewhere. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, it I love that. And I think for me, that's one of the areas that is, as soon as we get off this call, <laughs> I'm going to start working on because I, I want to add some more live plants to my snake enclosures. But lighting is something that I've not really explored before. And I'm definitely going to start looking because uh, it's it's def yeah, it's a gap in my care. And I, I'm really excited to add that. And I know that Arcadia has an amazing amount of different lights. And you guys have a really great function on your website to sort of type in the species of animal that you have. And it will give you a perfect guide for what you need. Yes. Yes, that covers 180 species, and we're, we're adding to that all the time. It works in the International Unit of UV Index, and so you can type in the common name or Latin name of, of your species into the search function, and then all you have to do is uh, it works on height. Uh, energy, light 
because light spreads out over distance, you're sharing photons over area the further light travels. So the further away a light source is, the weaker its measurable projection is um, by the time light reaches the area you want it to. So you, all you have to do is select the distance between your lamp and the between the lamp and your animal at, at the basking point, and it will tell you the exact lamp that you need to recreate wild types of energy for your exact species. Um, it's it's free. It's very easy to use, and it's growing all the time. Um, so please use it. It took me years of very yeah. boring work, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, uh, it's really, really useful. And um, I was uh, two things I was surprised by. One, the price point of the Arca Arcadia lamps is incredibly reasonable. Like I was going through all this work and, you know, looking at this, your site and looking at the light sources that I should have and I was expecting these bulbs to be incredibly expensive because the amount how professional and well done the site is and and they're right in range with everybody else or even cheaper for a lot of them which is great to see and and the other thing I was surprised that actually I didn't really know was how much this a screen can in interfere with your UV output yes Just exactly mesh, so. yeah yeah I mean from new you're looking at a 30 to 40 percent reduction and that's because you've put a barrier in front of the light you're literally reflecting photons back upwards um that that gets worse over time because metal starts to rust and calcify and you get dust so the smaller you make the holes in the mesh the the less light goes through so if you mesh tops are great you know we all use them but just run a wire brush over them once a month just keep those holes clear um to let as much light through as possible and then you can make the right lamp choices by uh, increasing or decreasing the percentage of ultraviolet to to um within the lamp to uh, to project the index that you need awesome well yeah that's a fantastic tip so uh, i really appreciate you coming on today john this is a really great conversation i think we're just sort of scratching the surface with a lot of things but hopefully this gets a lot of people thinking including myself of different areas that i can improve my care and i'm really excited to do that what are some some ways that people can find you and find more information as well as your books well, I, I, I pride myself at being really easy to get hold of. If you send me a question, generally you'll get an answer very, very quickly. I'm not some uh, stuck away in an office guy. I'm passionate about reptiles. So if you write to me, you can use the info at arcadia-reptile.com um, website, address, uh, email address. You can email in through our website. Um, you can stumble across me on all sorts of forms of social media and I will generally answer you uh, quite quickly. And, um, you know, I'm always happy to to hear stories and try and sort problems out that you might be having with your animals. If I can help, I always will. The website address is arcadiareptile.com and there's arcadiabird.com. We have a YouTube channel, which is growing quite quickly, doing quite nicely. There's Facebook and Instagram. We, I just like to be easy to get hold of. Um, so, so, so hopefully you should be able to get hold of me. Yeah, and I can attest to that. You answered my initial email very, very quickly. I was quite surprised, but that was great. And, uh, and then your books are available. I think you can get them off Arcadia, but also depending on where you are, there's different uh, reptiles are us and Canada sells them. And uh, what about the United States? Is there a supplier? Yeah, in the United States, we have two main agent importing agents in the United States. That's Reptile Basics and LikeYourReptiles.com. And they, uh, the, the, there's stores that sell our product as well. So Pangea Reptiles, the Bio Dude, uh, Triple L Reptiles. There's, there's quite a few um shops coming on board in in the united states it's reptiles are us in canada arcadia bird and reptile in australia and um it just all over the world you, you you can get hold of them and i've 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 tried to create titles that that are affordable our books aren't they're not expensive no they're um, they're definitely so inexpensive i was actually surprised that they were like really good like high quality hardcover books with nice gloss pictures and everything yeah. I, because of because they were i think it was only like 30 dollars i paid and i'm really excited to to finish both of them because they they're incredibly good resources for everybody thank you thank you well john it was a pleasure having you on i really really appreciate you uh taking the time today so thank you so much yeah no excellent to speak to you and uh Everyone, just keep on doing what you're doing. We'll progress this hobby and progress it. What we want is ethical, effective, safe reptile keeping. That's what we want. Amen. Yes. <laughs>
All right, that is the end of another episode. Thank you so much for listening to that. I do really, really hope that you got something out of that conversation. Whether or not you're a beginner, an intermediate, or an advanced hobbyist, there's something in that conversation for everybody. I think John does a, an amazing job at sort of being very inclusive. You know, everybody in the hobby is there for the same reason. And not knowing John before this conversation, I wasn't sure if he was going to come out sort of guns blazing, bioactive is the only way to go, or if he was going to be more realistic with the way he answers questions. And he is 100% realistic. He understands that there's a there's sort of a stepping stone and the hobby should be about progressing from one sort of maybe more basic, simplistic care to more advanced care. And, th and that's really what the hobby should be about. So I was really, that was really refreshing to hear him say that and, and for him to come off that way. And you might be wondering why we didn't go down specific care rabbit holes about specific things. And I wanted to stay away from that just because there is way too much content to cover in a 60 minute conversation. John has written four books. If you're interested in that stuff, and I highly recommend you go pick these books up because they are really, really detailed and they'll answer all the questions you have. We, we can't have a 60 minute conversation and go through sort of a couple hundred pages worth of content or more. And the value of this conversation is in sort of promoting everybody to want to do better with their care. And that's what I got out of it. So the first thing that I, there's several things that I wanted to change. As soon as we got off that call, I started ordering things, but I want to add UV for my nocturnal animals. So I already did that with my crested gecko a couple weeks ago. I ordered the shade dweller from Arcadia. I've added UV for his enclosure. My geckos are already fairly, they're already in a bioactive setup, but I do have some plastic and silk plants. I absolutely want to get rid of those after talking to John. I'm going to be adding more plants. I'm probably going to do a little bit more sort of redoing their cages a little bit. But now I want to add live plants to my snake enclosures as well as the UV like I had mentioned. And I want to do some leaf litter at some point this summer now that the leaves are finally growing again. I'm going to go out and collect leaf litter and do a bunch of leaf litter, more hiding spots. There's just so much more I'm motivated to do right now. I'm really, really excited to get to it. So I can't wait to add live plants to the snakes, although I have a feeling my boas might terrorize it. So I got to figure out a way to, to make it so they don't uh, turn the live plants into a bunch of piles of rubble. But really really excited to to watch my animals interact and it was almost like a refreshing like a, a refreshing moment in my hobby where I, I we all get stuck wanting different animals and wanting new animals and it, it's that hardware or that sort of operating system glitch that i talk about in the episode is we're always looking for something new and i think that's just human nature we always the more things we can have the better and like john said we are collectors so if we can redirect that into collecting information just doing a better job with the care for the animals that you have that's what we all need to be doing there's something super peculiar about just wanting to have animals that look different. And I think that's where the morph market has kind of got out of control as well, because it's like we, we always want things that we can't have. So the things that are more uncommon, we want the things that are more common, we don't really care about. And as uncommon things become common, we stop to, we stop kind of stop caring about them. You know, it's very strange. I, I saw this picture of a, a blue green tree python you know there's some, some morphs that really bring out a lot of the blue and it seems so cool like everybody wants one but if it was reversed and all green tree pythons were actually blue like maybe we called them blue tree pythons and there was a morph that allowed them to be green or display a green phenotype once in a while we'd all be obsessed with the green ones so it actually has nothing to do with the appearance it has everything to do with sort of the elusiveness or the rarity of it and it's definitely a glitch in the way our mind works and we don't want that overriding the way we collect and care for animals because what happens is you end up with 50 animals that all look different and you get a spike of dopamine when you buy a new animal and it's super exciting and then you the only way to get that dopamine spike again is by buying a new animal and it's just not good it's not natural so for me right now i'm super excited because i'm getting all this positive feedback from my animals i'm really eager to create better and stronger enclosures with with more enrichment and and that's going to be that sort of dopamine boost that's going to carry me through the hobby i'm going to watch my animals interact with their with their environments and whatnot so 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 that is just probably the most important thing i pulled out of that conversation with john so i think the last thing i'll say here is i'll just tell you guys a really quick story of an experience that i had about two weeks ago so i have this one boa who i've had for I think three or four years and I kind of rescued her out of a really horrible situation and and there's been some weird things with the in the past with this boa she had a, a she was involved in a tough pregnancy that there was a power outage during the pregnancy and and whatnot she has a kinked tail and there's some sort of, sort of defects along with that and I've always been somewhat worried about this snake everything about her is normal she eats well she poops she sheds she's moving moves around her enclosure but I always 
her, her muscle tone always seemed to be quite low. And I always wasn't sure if she was underweight, even though I was feeding her sort of an appropriate amount. And I, I really wanted to ask somebody an opinion on this animal. But then all of a sudden I had this sort of spike of fear, like, oh my gosh, I can't ask on a forum because then people might know who I am. They might know that I'm the host of the Animals at Home podcast. And they might think like, wow, he, he should know this. He's, he's an animal expert since he's on YouTube. And uh, I actually thought that. I actually thought like, wow, I can't ask that question because it will look bad on me. But then I thought, wait a minute. One, I'm absolutely not an expert. Two, I absolutely deserve to be able to ask questions whenever I want. It's, it's, it's what the hobby is. The hobby is about growth. That is the fun part about the hobby, learning new things. So then I went off and I asked on this forum and everyone was, you know, very polite and said, no, the snake looks fine. She's in good health. Some snakes have a little bit lower muscle tone or whatever. So it's something that I think probably happens often with people who put themselves on YouTube or in a podcast is all of a sudden you put yourself in this state where you feel like you must act as an expert and then you can no longer ask questions. And that's actually really, really bad. And I, I, I'm going to be very conscious of that from now on to make sure that I'm not putting myself in a state where it feels like I need to be the know all of everything to do with reptiles. It's absolutely not what I want. And because the purpose of the hobby is for us to grow and to learn new things. And, and that's where the fun part is. The fun part is evolving in the hobby. And I was surprised that I was worried about asking questions when two years ago I wouldn't have. So I think that's just a sort of a sort of on a personal note. There's there's that sort of danger of the internet experts out there. And I think that sort of stagnates the hobby. So it's something I'm going to watch for because of the situation that I'm in. But I, I think you should watch for it as well just to make sure that you're not hitting a point where you feel like you know everything you need to know. There's always more to learn here and the animals are the ones that will teach us. All right, I will leave it at that. I know that's a lot more than I normally say after an episode, but really, really important episode. Please share this episode with everyone else in the hobby. I think this is what John said in this episode is something that I think everybody in the hobby should hear and everybody deserves to sort of reanalyze the way they're caring for things. So I will let you guys get on with the rest of the day. Thank you so much for listening to this episode and I'll talk to you in a couple weeks.